chapter? Defense Buster, the story of the immortal George Herman Babe Ruth. Yankee Stadium in New York City. They call it the house that Ruth built with good reason. His mighty bat was the magnet that drew the crowds. That bat, the terror of major league pitchers, had won him all that the nation could offer. Wealth and fame and popularity. The cheers of the crowd. The love and admiration of America's children to whom his signature was precious. He had everything, yet he knew disappointment and heartbreak. Yet in the end, he learned to overcome failure and earned a deathless place in the American story. For George Herman Ruth, the beginning was in the slums of Baltimore, Maryland. His father's saloon and the slum streets were his playground. His playmates were tough, and the games they played were frowned on by the police. He wound up in reform school, St. Mary's, run by kindly priests. They trained him to become a tailor, but in his spare time, young Ruth played baseball. Played it so well that in 1914, he went almost directly from St. Mary's to the big leagues. A rookie pitcher with the Boston Red Sox, salary, $2,500 a year. To you, a kid from the slums, it seemed like all the money in the world. But your bat soon became more valuable to the Red Sox than your pitching arm, so you were shifted to the outfield where you could take your turn at bat every day. The result, a new home run champion and the beginning of a new era in baseball. Ruth hit 29 home runs during the season of 1919. Some observers called it a freak the babe would never equal. But Colonel Jake Rupert, owner of the New York Yankees, didn't agree. He paid the Red Sox $100,000 for Ruth's contract and paid the babe $20,000 a year to don the Yankee uniform. The Yankees had never won a pennant before Ruth joined the team in 1920. That year, sparked by the Bambino's phenomenal hitting, they came close. Next year, with Ruth shattering his own record by slamming out 59 home runs, they finally made it. Their first American League pennant and World Series victory. 1921, the Roaring Twenties were getting underway. Women's skirts were going up over the knee, and morals were going down. Bathing beauties began competing for the title of Miss America. Remember Tom Mix? In movie land, he rode the range in defense of law and order. While in the big cities, mobsters shot it out with Tommy guns for possession of an empire of bootleg whiskey. Jack Dempsey had just pounded his way to the heavyweight championship of the world. Big Bill Tilden was the Mr. Big of the tennis courts. Bobby Jones was polishing up the swing that would soon make him ruler of golfdom. Heroes all, and the greatest of them was the Sultan of Swat, Babe Ruth. Greatest hero and the greatest sucker. 1925. As always, the fans jammed Yankee Stadium to see Babe Ruth ram out the homers. Instead, they saw a fat man swinging ineffectually at the ball. Fame had gone to Ruth's head. The Bambino had become an overstuffed playboy. From the batting champion of 1924, he became the big bust of 1925. And the brightest star of baseball suddenly fizzled out. Was the Bambino finished? It looked that way. Failure in mid-career. Was he washed up as the sports writers and fans predicted? That winter, the babe proved them wrong. The comeback trail was hard, but Ruth was determined to sweat off that excess poundage. When the 1926 baseball season opened, the babe was ready. Those workouts had brought the speed back to his body, the sharpness to his eyes, and power to his arms. Again, the home runs boomed off the big bat. 47 home runs in 1926, 60 the next year, an all-time record. 54 home runs in 1928 and 46 in 1929. The Babe was at the height of his fame, captain of the greatest team that ever stepped on a diamond, king of Murderer's Row, the slugging Yankee outfield of Combs, Ruth, and Musel. His teammates were stars like pitcher Herb Pennock and the greatest first baseman of them all, Lou Gehrig. 
Ruth's ambition was to follow Miller Huggins as manager of those men when his playing career was over. And by 1929, his playing days were drawing to a close. Then in September of that year, it happened. The logical man for the job was Babe Ruth. Colonel Rupert promised to consider him. A few days later, the Babe got his decision from the newspapers. Ruth knew why he had been rejected. Although he had settled down, Rupert didn't believe the Babe had finally grown up. Ruth was bitter. If he couldn't be manager of the Yankees, he wanted money, a lot of it. His new contract called for $80,000 a year. As the baseball campaigns of the early 30s rolled on, the Bambino didn't permit his disappointment to interfere with his performance on the ball field. A decade of baseball had taken its toll, but there was plenty of power left in the big bat. He gave the fans a smashing demonstration of that power in the World Series of 1932 against the Chicago Cubs. There was bad feeling between the two teams. The Chicago fans were wildly partisan, and the focus of their anger was Babe Ruth. Screaming fans booed the Bambino from the railroad station to his hotel, and from the hotel to the baseball stadium. They packed Wrigley Field, rooting for the home team, shouting insults at the Yankees, with a special emphasis on Ruth. The Babe had his revenge on the field. As he went to bat in the fourth inning, the crowd rose jeering to its collective feet. The babe replied by pointing to the spot where he intended to hit the ball, far out in the center field bleachers. The angry fans razzed louder. Again, Ruth pointed to those far off bleachers, while in his heart he prayed that Charlie Ruth, the Chicago hurler, would throw a fastball with his next pitch. He did. A home run in the center field bleachers, the exact spot to which he had pointed. You felt pretty good as you rounded the bases, babe. You'd show them that the old man wasn't finished, not yet. But the seeds of the finish were there in those slender, weary legs, and you knew it. Sit down, babe. Save your strength. You'll need all of it and more during the next few years. The Bambino went downhill fast in 1933 and 1934, the beginning of the end came in 1935 when the Yankees released him to the Boston Braves. He was an old man now as baseball counts the years. He poked feebly at balls he formerly would have smashed out of the ballpark. Sorrowfully, the Sultan of Swat realized that the time had come to quit. It was a relief to drop the Braves' uniform on the bench, for in his heart, Babe Ruth had never stopped being a Yankee. Unhappy because there was no place for him in the game he loved, Ruth turned to his second love, golf. Ruth went back to Yankee Stadium on Lou Gehrig Day, July 4th, 1939, to pay tribute to an old friend. The iron horse of baseball had reached the end. Now, sadly, he was bidding baseball farewell. Today, today. I consider, I consider myself, myself the luckiest, the luckiest man, man on the face, on the of, the face earth. of the earth. Ruth thought a grim moment like this could never happen again, but it did to the babe himself. Eight years later, he'd been so sick the doctors at Memorial Hospital in New York had almost given up. And then a miracle of letters from kids. He was their legendary hero and they were pulling for him to live. For the first time since he had taken off his Yankee uniform, Babe Ruth found in those letters a cause worth living for. Ruth came out of the hospital with a single fixed idea, to devote the remainder of his life to the welfare of America's children. That was the thought he carried with him to Yankee Stadium on Babe Ruth's day, 1947. Drawn and feeble, he stood on the spot where Lou Gehrig had stood. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You know how bad my voice sounds. Well, it feels just as bad. You know this baseball game of ours comes up from the you. That means the boys. And after you're a boy and go up to the wild to play ball, then you come to the boys you see representing 
themselves today in your national pastime. The only real game, I think, in the world, baseball. But only a few good days like that one were left. Soon the pains returned worse than ever, back to the hospital. This time nothing could help. This time it was for keeps. Yankee Stadium, scene of George Herman Ruth's triumphs. He goes there for the last time. The kid from the slums of Baltimore who went on and up to become the Sultan of Swat is carried to his last resting place. With him go the tears and prayers of a million ball fans for whom he symbolized all that was good in America's national pastime. He was their hero, and they mourned him. He had lived a life of thrills and confusion. He had known the peaks of glory and the valleys of despair. He had searched for meaning, and in the end he found meaning. George Herman Ruth left behind him two lasting monuments. Yankee Stadium, the house that Ruth built, and future generations of American youngsters carrying on the game he loved. So long, babe.